her home state of South Carolina, but she's been the biggest climber in the polls since the summer, going from single digits to as high as 29% in New Hampshire and up to 70% in Iowa, based on the most recent polls. Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley joins us for a conversation this morning. Thanks so much for being here. Oh, it's great to be here. So we are now barely more than three weeks from the Iowa caucus. It's just under a month until New Hampshire and two months before South Carolina's primary, your state, of course. Yes. Uh, there's no denying your trajectory in the state polls. Do you have to win one of these three states to really have a chance at the nomination? I think we have to be strong in Iowa, strong in New Hampshire, strong in South Carolina. That's our goal. That's what we're trying to do. And we're doing it by touching as many hands as we can, answering every question. I'm the last person to leave in every town hall. And we're going to fight for every single Iowan's vote. Now, there is no denying that your biggest political challenge is Donald Trump. You had an interview with ABC News recently saying Donald Trump had the chance to stop what happened on January 6th, but didn't. We just know that Colorado Supreme Court just pulled him off the primary ballot because of his role on January 6th, or what the justices determined, citing the insurrection uh, the, and the clause of the 14th Amendment specifically. Do you agree with the decision? Look, I think that we Donald Trump should not be the next president. I think he was the right president at the right time. I agree with a lot of his policies. But rightly or wrongly, once again, chaos follows him. And we can't be a country in disarray and a world on fire and go through four more years of chaos. You don't fix Democrat chaos with a Republican chaos. And now what you see happen in Colorado, I want to beat him fair and square. So that judges means you don't want not, to pull off the ballot. Judges should not be pulling him off the ballot. That's not democracy. Voters are the only ones that can pull someone off the ballot. And so I was very disappointed they did this. I think the people of Colorado should be disappointed. I trust the American people to make whatever decision they need to. But you can't have justices, because they don't like someone or because they feel strongly about someone, take their name off the ballot. If we start doing that, we're going to start to see a lot of problems. But isn't the Constitution itself democracy? And here in case the 14th Amendment. But if you talk about insurrection, I mean, you look at that, that was really meant for like the Civil War. As awful as January 6th was, and I have said we that was a terrible day, we can never have that repeated, and I think Trump could have done something to stop that along the way, and he didn't. But that that's a far stretch to compare that to something like the Civil War. We can't do that. But I trust the people. We need to let the people make this decision. But really, you don't want to start getting to where you're giving judges that much power that they can decide who can and can't be off the ballot. I think the Supreme Court's going to strike this down right away. You've called for publicly for mental capacity tests for anyone who wants to be president. I know you're critical of President Biden in this area. Do you think Donald Trump has the mental capacity to be president at this point? I said that I don't think we need to have two presidential candidates that are going to be in their 80s. That's unprecedented that we would be looking into that. I think we need a new generation. I think we need a new generational conservative leader that's going to leave the baggage and the negativity behind us and go forward. And so this is not about, you know, whether President Trump is fit or not. It's about the fact that I don't think our country can go through four more years of that chaos. I think that Joe Biden has proven he's not fit to be president. We don't need to have him either. And the country wants a new generational leader. I mean, right now, the Senate's the most privileged nursing home in the country. We've got to start focusing on the fact that these are people making decisions on our national security. They're making decisions on the future of our economy. We need to know that people are at the top of their game. That's why this is so important. Now, we can't ignore the fact that you worked for the Donald Trump administration as the ambassador to the United Nations, a job you held for less than two years, almost two years. During that tenure, you announced the United States would impose uh, sanctions and on Russia and on Syria, only to see that ultimately blocked by the administration. Are those among the reasons you left the administration? No. Actually, I had a good working relationship um, with President Trump when I was there. And the reason I had a good working relationship and got out of there without a tweet is because I told him the truth. If he was doing something right, I fought, I rallied, I wanted America to look strong. If he was doing something that I thought was wrong, I showed up in his office, I picked up the phone, I called him, and I'd say, you cannot do this. But instead, you could do X, Y, or Z. I always gave him options. And he would say, well, how do you see that playing out? And he knows I say him on some things. What we did, and it was two years at the UN, what I did at the UN, we pulled ourselves out of the Iran deal. 
We moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. I negotiated the largest set of sanctions against a country in a generation against North Korea by pushing China to do it. We got ourselves out of the Human Rights Council and the Paris Climate Agreement. We stopped any taxpayer money going to the Palestinian refugee organization. But the best thing we did was we took the kick me sign off of our backs and America was respected again at the UN. I've always given my truth. Anti-Trumpers don't think I hate him enough. Pro-Trumpers don't think I love him enough. I call it like I see it, and I do what's best for the country. I always have and I always will. Do you feel that you're walking a fine line when you talk about the pro-Trumpers or the anti-Trumpers um, because you're afraid to have those anti-Trumpers in case you want those votes if for some reason Donald Trump can't fulfill his role as a nominee? No, I think it's because it, this isn't personal for me. It's not personal about a person. I actually think that's when things start to go the wrong way. This is very much about policy. This is about national security for the American people. This is about getting our economy back on track. People feel it when they go to the grocery store, how expensive it is. When they go to the gas station, their mortgage payments are higher. Their insurance payments are higher. Everything that we have to pay right now has gone up. And now people feel like they work for government. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Government's supposed to serve the people. And we've got to get it back to that. More of our conversation on the way coming up. Her role in backing out of the Iran nuclear deal. How much that decision put Israel pulling the United States out of the nuclear agreement with Iran, the biggest threat to Israel. Back to the conversation. You've come out strongly to support funding Ukraine and Israel in both of their wars. Your Republican challengers don't always seem as gung-ho in this area. Critics of Donald Trump say he's too cozy with Vladimir Putin. Ron DeSantis has fluctuated on Ukraine while supporting Israel. Why are you so committed to the United States helping both of these countries rather than let them fend for themselves? America can never be so arrogant to think we don't need friends. On September 12th, we needed a lot of friends. To get friends, you gotta be a friend. Here you have Ukraine, a pro-American, freedom-loving country that was invaded by a thug. Half a million people have died because of Putin. Now, I don't think we should ever give cash to any country because you can't follow it. I don't think we need to put troops on the ground because the Ukrainians wanna do this themselves. I'm the wife of a combat veteran, he's deployed now. I don't wanna see him go to war. But we should give them the equipment and ammunition to win. And the reason is, dictators and tyrants, I saw this at the United Nations, they tell you exactly what they're going to do. They're actually very transparent. China said they were going to take Hong Kong. They did. Russia said they were going to take Ukraine. We watched them. China says Taiwan is next. We better believe them. Russia said after they take Ukraine, Poland and the Baltics are next. Those are NATO countries, and that puts America at war. This is about preventing war. It should always be about prevention of war. That's why I think we need to support Ukraine. During your tenure as US, um, UN ambassador, rather, you mentioned earlier how the Trump administration pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal. That deal intended, of course, to keep Iran's nuclear ambitions in check regarding weaponry. Iran is also known to support Hezbollah and Hamas. Um, what do you say to people who feel backing out of the Iran deal only emboldened Iran to support Hamas? And now we've seen the, the Houthi rebels in Yemen fighting to control the Red Sea. Well, I'll tell you that when we went to go get out of the Iran deal, Congress put a stopgap because Obama just pushed it through. And Congress did a law that said every 90 days a president would have to say that it was still in the best interest of the American people to stay in the Iran deal. And so when Trump's 90 days came up, I could tell he was uncomfortable about it. I was uncomfortable about it because Iran was violating every UN resolution they were supposed to be following. And so I asked him to let me go to Vienna and go to the International Atomic Energy Agency to see exactly how the Iran deal worked. And he let me go. And when I got there, I said, we know that a lot of the research for nuclear production happens in the universities. How often do you inspect the universities? They said, we don't inspect the universities. I said, okay, well, we know that all of the production for the, the nuclear production happens at the military installations. How often do you inspect the military installations? They said, we're not allowed to check the military installations. I said, okay, well, then what do you inspect? They said, if we get a tip, we give them 45 days notice, and then we inspect. I came back and told the president, not only should he get out of the Iran deal, it would be irresponsible to not get out of the Iran deal. 
That's not what emboldened Iran. What emboldened Iran was Biden falling all over himself to get back into the Iran deal because he lifted the sanctions and billions of dollars flowed from China importing their oil. There would be no Hamas without Iran. There would be no Hezbollah without Iran. There wouldn't be the Houthis without Iran. But when you give Iran money, they fuel these proxies and these proxies do terrorist activity and we're all paying the price for that. He never should have lifted the sanctions. He never should have given them six billion dollars for five hostages and we inspect. I came back and told the president, not only should he get out of the Iran deal, it would be irresponsible to not get out of the Iran deal. That's not what emboldened Iran. What emboldened Iran was Biden falling all over himself to get back into the Iran deal because he lifted the sanctions and billions of dollars flowed from China importing their oil. There would be no Hamas without Iran. There would be no Hezbollah without Iran. There wouldn't be the Houthis without Iran. But when you give Iran money, they fuel these proxies and these proxies do terrorist activity and we're all paying the price for that. He never should have lifted the sanctions. He never should have given them six billion dollars for five hostages, that's what emboldened Iran. One of the issues where you distinguish yourself from the other Republican candidates during the debates we saw was when you was related to abortion, domestic policy now, Heron. You gave nuanced answers about opposing the procedure while expressing compassion for the women who have to deal with it and maybe ultimately make the choice to have an abortion. You also said there's no reason to have a national ban because Republicans don't have the 60 votes in the Senate to do it. That is just basically a moot point. Does that mean if you had the supermajority, you would pursue a national ban on abortion? What that means is I'm not going to demonize this issue anymore. What we have seen from Democrats, they have tried to put fear in women that abortions are going to be banned. What we've seen from Republicans is they've used judgment. This is too personal of an issue to have fear or judgment. What I have said is unelected justices never should have been deciding this. They decided that it should be in the hands of the people. That's the right place for it to be. I am unapologetically pro-life. Not because the Republican Party tells me to be, but because my husband is adopted. I had trouble having both of my children. But this is incredibly personal. So for it to be back in the hands of the people, that's where it should be. But it's not Some of the states have been more pro-life. I welcome that. Some of the states have gone more pro-choice. I wish that wasn't the case, but the people decided. But if you're going to talk about a federal law, tell the people the truth. Tell the American people the truth. The only way to have a federal law is a majority of the House, 60 Senate votes votes and a signature of a president. We haven't had 60 Republicans in over 100 years. We might have 45 pro-life senators. So no Republican president can ban any ban abortions pers- any more than a Democrat president can ban these state laws. But would you have if you had that if you had a 60 vote majority, is that something you would favor? What I have said is the only way we're going to get 60 votes is if we have consensus. And the only way we're going to get consensus is if we say can we come together and ban late term abortions? Can we encourage adoptions and good quality adoptions? Can we say that no doctor or nurse that doesn't believe in abortion should have to perform them? We should make sure that contraception is accessible. And can't we say that no state law should tell a woman who's had an abortion that she's going to jail or get the death penalty. Let's start there. Let's humanize this issue. I had a roommate in college who was raped. I wouldn't wish on anyone to go through what she went through wondering if she was if she was pregnant. Everybody has a story. Let's be respectful of the story. But the way, I'm sorry, the fellows don't know how to talk about it. The way they try and imply that this is going to happen or this fear is going to happen or that it's wrong. We need to be respectful about this issue and do it in a way that we come together. The goal should be how do we save as many babies as possible and support as many moms as possible. That should be the goal for everyone. We've got more with Nikki Haley. Still to come gun violence. What approach she would take after being on the job for one of the worst. You're watching For the Record. Once again, here's your host, Jim Needleman. Nikki Haley was South Carolina's governor when a bigot went into a black church and opened fire. That was eight years ago. We turned the discussion to gun violence. You were South Carolina's governor when nine African Americans were murdered at their church in Charleston by a white supremacist. It eventually led to the removal of the Confederate state flag outside the South Carolina capitol. Mass shootings always bring up the debate about gun rights, assault weapons bans, limiting ammunition magazines. They've also brought more attention to mental health. I guess, how would you approach gun violence? Is it something the president can do? You know, I have a mom heart. My daughter is a pediatric nurse at the Children's Hospital. I worry about something happening there. My son is a senior in college. I worry about something happening to him. In order to deal with this, America has to deal with the cancer that is mental health. One in three people suffer from a mental health issue. But if treated, 
they can live a perfectly normal life. The problem is we don't have enough mental health therapists. We don't have any mental health treatment centers. If you don't get your mental health issue taken care of, you can fall into addiction. We don't have enough addiction centers. And if you happen to have one of those three, insurance doesn't cover any of it. We have got to start addressing this. 80% of mass shootings happen from someone who's having a mental crisis. Well, we see the government actually take away from a lot of those services, especially Republican governors. Take away from a lot of... Those mental health services. Those are social services. I'm telling you that we need those services. I'm telling you we have to have more therapists. We have to have mental health um, centers. We have to start having more addiction centers. We've got to treat this. We're seeing a younger generation that's having more anxiety, stress, and depression than ever before. Does the supply side also have to be addressed regarding gun violence, though, as well? Well, I think you look at that, and look, I think right now with the lawlessness that we're seeing all over the country, the last thing you could do is go to someone and say, you can't protect your family by owning a gun. I think what you need to do instead, and and what I'm not going to do is go appease people by saying, oh, we're going to get rid of this kind of gun or that kind of gun. That'll make them feel better for about a week, and then we'll hear of the next shooting. If we're going to do this right, let's go after the mental health issue. Let's get these stolen guns off the streets. And the way you do that is prosecutors have to prosecute according to the law. Law enforcement's exhausted that they arrest these people with stolen guns, and they let them right back out the very next day. And let's make sure that we start to bring law and order back. If there's not a price to pay for committing a crime, they're just going to keep on doing that. And then let's secure our schools. They should be as secure as airports and courthouses. Those are our children. We need to make sure we're doing that for every single school. There are things we can do. It's that we have to do the hard work to make that happen. If we do, that's what's going to make America more safe. One more piece of international policy. A lot of the Republicans are talking tough on China. You're among them, for sure. One of the policies you said you would pursue would be to ban China from buying land in the United States and force it to sell any land it already owns. Um, however, during your days as governor, your state had more Chinese investment, really, than any other Republican governor, almost $600 billion. What do you say to people who call it kind of a hypocr- hypocritical stance? I think every governor in the country has tried to recruit Chinese sure. companies. Sure. Just like every... But is this, an, this is an about face? Every governor in the country tried to... In- recruit Chinese companies, just like every American household has Chinese products. Me recruiting a fiberglass company 10 years ago is very different than what we know about China today. That was 1%. Do you regret that stance, though? At the time, a fiberglass company coming to South Carolina didn't mean anything. But in that was 1% of the companies we brought. We built planes with Boeing. We built more BMWs than any place in the world. We brought a Mercedes-Benz, Volvo, five international tire companies. They referred to us as the beast of the Southeast. So one Chinese fiberglass company 10 years ago is not going to deal with the fact that I have fought China every day that I was at the United Nations and every day since because I saw exactly what they're trying to do to us. They don't see us as a competitor, they see us as an enemy. And we are putting our head in the sand when it comes to China. And we need to start looking at them the way they look at us. And when we do that, that that means we have to get all the intrusion out of our country, stop selling them any U.S. soil, take back what they've done, stop any foreign money going to our universities by telling universities you either take foreign money or you take American money, but the days of taking both are over. Stop sending them technology that allows them to build up their military. Tell them we're going to end all normal trade relations with them until they stop murdering Americans with fentanyl. We've had more Americans die than the Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan wars combined. And let's strengthen our military because strong militaries don't start wars. Strong militaries prevent wars. That's what we have to do with China. Still more of the conversation to come. First, our question of the week. What do you think about Nikki Haley as a Republican presidential candidate? Send your answer by email to for the record at WHBF.com or respond to this post on Facebook at the Local 4 News WHBF TV page or on my page. Straight ahead, Joan of Art. Why Nikki Haley has a soft spot in her heart for a rock and roller with the black hearts. You're watching for the record. Getting around isn't as easy. One more thing before we go. On a lighter note. Uh, I read about some of your role models and heroes over the years, women who have been leaders. And I think people might be surprised if you even list a couple of Democrats on there, Gabby Giffords, Hillary Clinton, because they've shown that women can be successful. Republicans are conservatives as well, Margaret Thatcher among them. Your mom, certainly, all certainly uh, worthwhile, of course. Also on that list, Joan Jett, I saw. So 
I want to know how much you love rock and roll. If you had another dime to put in the jukebox, what song or songs would you play today? I mean, look, I love rock and roll. It's a fantastic one. Crimson and Clover is a fantastic one. Bad Reputation's a you know fantastic one. I love Joan Jett. I always have. I mean, look, I think the reason when you see women do well, even though people like Hillary Clinton, I don't think I've ever agreed with her. I'm surprised you even list a couple of Democrats on there, Gabby Giffords, Hillary Clinton, because they've shown that women can be successful. Republicans are conservatives as well, Margaret Thatcher among them. Your mom, certainly, all certainly uh, worthwhile, of course. Also on that list, Joan Jett, I saw. So... I want to know how much you love rock and roll. If you had another dime to put in the jukebox, what song or songs would you play today? I mean, look, I love rock and roll. It's a fantastic one. Crimson and Clover is a fantastic one. Bad Reputation's a you know fantastic one. I love Joan Jett. I always have. I mean, look, I think the reason when you see women do well, even though people like Hillary Clinton, I don't think I've ever agreed with her on anything. But when I was thinking about running for office, Everybody told me why I shouldn't do it. You're young. You have young children. You know, you should start at the school board level. And then I went to a women's leadership forum at Furman University, and Hillary Clinton happened to be one of the speakers. And she said, for every reason, for every reason people tell you not to do something, it's exactly why you should do it. I left there, and I said, I'm running for office. Now, you know, if women go and continue to hold the ladder down and continue to show that strong girls become strong women, strong women become strong leaders, that's why we have to make sure we grow strong girls. That's why I fight so much against biological boys playing in girls' sports. There's no place for that. Our goal is to give women and young girls confidence so that they know they can do anything they want to do. Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley, thanks for the conversation. Good luck with the campaign. Thanks so much. Here's what you thought of our last question of the week. We asked, what do you think about Ron DeSantis as a Republican candidate for president? Dave starts, DeSantis has a proven leadership record as governor of Florida and would make an excellent president of the United States. Jeff says he has yet to show he can distance himself from Donald Trump. Not a good indication of his ability to lead. Gary finishes, Ron DeSantis' interview with you made me like Nikki Haley even more. 